A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Well, it's good to have you here on such a warm morning. Uh, Amazing. As of two weeks ago, it's four times warmer today than it was two weeks ago Friday when it was nine degrees. So that's fantastic. Uh, Glad to have you here in the room. Those of you online, thanks for worshiping with us today. Those of you at our Skagit campus, as always, glad to have you with us. We are today in the very middle of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Some would call this hump day. This is the middle day of our 21 days. And for those of you who are participating, we've been praying for you in your experience as you seek God, as you say no to some things so you can say yes to divine things. And I just want to encourage you. Some of you may have put out a plan a couple of weeks ago and you've kind of messed up. You've blown it. You're like, well, I tried, but there's always next year. Let me just say, I've put together a plan for my three, uh, three weeks and there are some things where I haven't bat a thousand. Give yourself some grace, pick it up, finish strong and continue to seek the Lord. Also want to encourage you, If in this time of the 21 days, it feels a little bit more like it's all about saying no and when can I get back to this or watching this or posting here or eating this or whatever it might be, let me remind you not just to to empty out but to fill up, to take those promptings of, oh, I, I wish I could have that cookie, that's mine, Uh, or some other things as well, to say, okay, but I want to hunger and thirst for you, God. I want to know you more. I want to be filled with more of you, with his word, with prayer, with silence, with worship. Continue to grow in that. So I want to encourage us us together as we are doing this as a community for our community and even beyond our walls here. So so today is um, almost uh, one month away from Christmas, and chances are some of your gifts have already been exchanged. Chances are some of them have already been regifted, or at least they're earmarked to regift for next year. Uh, or maybe they've already been put away or broken or whatever it might be. I have in this bag a Christmas gift that was given to me, and it was not put away. It was not regifted. It was, it was not exchanged. It was given to me 45 years ago. Christmas 1978, I was a sophomore in high school, and I asked my parents for a certain gift, and they gave it to me. What it is is the box set of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. And for 45 years, this box has been with me through high school, through college, through marriage, through (laughs) ministry, through kids, through all kinds of stuff. And uh, and if you've never read the Chronicles of Narnia, phenomenal. It was written for children, but it's got this picture anyway of of Jesus as the lion Aslan. It's it's an amazing deal. Which little side note I just read this week. That, and I'm not getting any um, monetary kickbacks for this, but Netflix is preparing to do a series of movies on the Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, Greta Gerwig, uh, Barbie director, you know Greta? She's directing these, and she says she's a little bit intimidating because it was such a beautiful part of her childhood. Okay, commercial for Netflix is over there. Uh, anyway, but the, the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia are... From, F- f- uh, f- phenomenal. And um, again, if you've not read them, it's not a spoiler alert, there's this analogy and that this lion Aslan is the Jesus figure in this and it's just beautiful the way it's done. In the second book, and there's debate on which order you should read these, but in the second book that was published, it was Prince Caspian. And in Prince Caspian, the children, uh, Edmund and and Peter and Susan and, and Lucy, have found themselves back in Narnia again. And in the course of this, uh, they find this little uh, beloved little elf or dwarf that's helping them out. Anyway, Lucy 
thinks that she sees Aslan, but none of the other kids see him, and they're not really sure if they should believe her. And then one night, she is woken from her sleep with this familiar voice, this calling, this drawing her away. And when she leaves the other children, she goes, she actually finds, finds Aslan. Now, there's no good church service without a little bit of a story time. So this is story time from Prince Caspian, page 136, in my book that originally was $1.75. So she sees Aslan and says, Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, at last. She gazed up into the large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, he said. Not because you are, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Story time over. <laughs> That's my prayer for us. That every year that we grow, not just age, not, but every year we grow in maturity, every year we grow more in our knowledge, our understanding of God, we will find him bigger. That we will see that there is more to God than we ever imagined before. And not in just some fanciful fairy tales that we're trying to exaggerate God. No, as we look into the truth of his word, where he has revealed himself, we will see in greater capacity who this God is. When we look at the majestic world that he's created, the heavens that declare his glory, we're going to talk about that more next week. When we look at that, that we will continue to grow in our understanding, our wonder, our worship, and our awe of how big God is. As his spirit brings revelation to us in our lives, in our personal lives, as he directs us, as he guides us, as we walk in experience of God's faithfulness, that every year that we grow older, he will get bigger. Because we have grown more in that knowledge. It is absolutely impossible to exaggerate God. It's impossible. Because even the greatest mind in here, and it's not mine, but even the greatest mind that's here today, there is no way that that mind can fully comprehend the greatness of God, can fully plumb the depths of God, can, can fully fathom the reaches of God. It's simply not possible. I love in Romans chapter 11 when Paul's writing all this deep theology, and then he stops like in the middle of it, chapter 11, and there's this little paragraph, this doxology, and he says, oh, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his pathways beyond searching out, beyond tracing out. It's beyond our capacity. We will never, ever, Get to the end of God's greatness and his goodness. Years ago, J.B. Phillips wrote a little book entitled, Your God is Too Small. Because the natural tendency of humanity is to shrink God down, is to diminish his greatness, is to, to have it. Now, this isn't new for us. This is the way it's been for all of human history. And that was the case with Israel. Because of their life circumstances, because of the situations that were going on, because of the hardships they had faced, the difficulties of life, because of the oppression they had had from other nations and leaders, world powers, because of what had happened to them nationally, because of their morale, they had either shrunk God down or they had had his greatness overshadowed by all of the circumstances of life. And Isaiah comes along and he wants to remind them of how great God is. He, Isaiah comes along with this, this J.B. Phillips moment when he says, your God is too small. At least your perception of him is way too narrow. And so we see, in, as we've looked at the, the, the series verse out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, where Isaiah writes this, you who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Behold your God. And he wants them to see that your God is so much bigger, so much greater, so much more majestic than you ever even imagined or believed. And that's what we see throughout Isaiah chapter 40. 
years ago, there was a movie that came out, and this isn't a blank endorsement of this movie. It didn't do well, like, as far as any kind of awards are concerned, but it really hit big with pubescent boys and youth pastors. I loved this movie. Uh, it was called Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> and I think that in Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah comes along and he says, your God is big and bigger. Like, just when I don't think you can get any bigger, you go and totally reveal yourself. You show me more. You're great and you're greater. You're mighty and mightier. You're magnificent and magnificenter. You're just bigger. He just pours this out. So we're devoting four or five weeks into pouring ourselves into this passage in Isaiah chapter 40, what some would consider one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture, the high water mark of the Old Testament. And there is so much to this. And what we're going to see is, again, Isaiah just peeling back the curtain, peeling back the layers, saying God is even greater. Now, today, we're really only going to look at two verses. And, uh, and, and, I, and we're going to look at them kind of phrase by phrase. We're just going to kind of walk through these things. And I'll, I'll try to make this sermon a little shorter than it could be. And, uh, and I will say this. Uh, because last week we basically looked at five verses. Next week we will really pick up the pace because if you've read Isaiah 40, and if you haven't, I want to encourage you to, you'll know that, man, we're never going to get through this if he doesn't pick up the pace. Next week we get going a little bit faster. So today we're going to look at two primary verses. Let me read them in the context of the verse of our series, starting in chapter uh, 40, verse 9 through verse 11. Let me read this straight through. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain, you who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. His arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart and gently leads those that have young. Now we looked at verse nine last week. We looked briefly at the end of verse 10, so I'm going to skip that one. Uh, we looked at that last week. But let's jump right in, and let's just go phrase by phrase as he says, I want you to look and see. I want you to behold your God. Verse 10 starts off in this translation, see. Others' translations again say, behold. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. Right at the very beginning, he says, I, I want you to remember who your God is. And he starts off and he says, he is the sovereign Lord. He is the Lord God. He's above all things. He is beyond all things. He is over all things. He is in control of all things. Remember, we're looking at your God. All the other nations had their deities, but I want you to look at your God. And your God is different than all of those other ones, that the idols and all these pagan gods that they're worshiping. Your God is the sovereign God. He is over it all. Now, they knew. They knew from the Old Testament, from the Torah, from the scriptures about their God. They knew. They grew up praying the, the Shema prayer out of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. They were a monotheistic nation. This was a rarity. There was one God. Other nations were polytheistic. They had multiple gods and different gods, a rain god and a corn god and a sun god and all these different gods. They had one. And it had been made very clear in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other God before me. He says, you know your God. Behold your God. There is one. But he's not just one of many. He's not just one in a certain classification of deities. Because again, some of them had all of these different gods and deities, and they were at different levels and different powers and all these different things, kind of like we do with stars. I mean, if, if you've ever studied stars even remotely, you know that there are different classifications of stars. There's there's red dwarfs and yellow dwarfs and blue dwarfs and white dwarfs and blue giants and red giants and all these different classifications. And, and our sun, ours like it belongs to us, the sun that we revolve around is a, is a yellow dwarf. It's considered a yellow dwarf, a relatively smaller star in, in the cosmos. And astrophysicists would even rank them in, in these different categories. They use these seven letters, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M class. We won't get into all this because this is not a, a, an astronomy class. But there's all these different rankings based on their size or their brightness or their, their, their power, or their age, and all these things. And sometimes we get this idea that there's these rankings of gods, and he would say, in your cultures, they would have that. But you will remember this, there is one God, 
and he is in a class by himself. There are no others that are even close. He's not one of several in this category. He is above them all. He has created all things. This is your God. And don't forget that. When all the other pagan nations are worshiping all these other deities, don't go chasing after them. For your own sake, you'll be wasting your time if you follow these other would-be gods. And it's not just amongst the deity that your God is over all. He is above all. Now, as, we, um, as we saw in the passage we looked at last week, he said, you know, all the people that are so impressive on this planet, he said, the people are like grass, like flowers. And the grass withers and the flowers fall. Like they don't last. But your God does. And all the nations, I mean, they, they were intimidated by these nations. To the south, there was Egypt. To the north, there was Assyria. To the east, there was Persia and Babylon. These nations, these world powers that all fight to control the globe, uh, the world as they know it. And he says, uh, later, we'll look at this next week, he says, all the nations are like, like a drop from a bucket. Th that's it. Oh, they look big in your eyes, but to me, they're hardly anything. And all the princes and all the rulers and all of these guys that are in so much power. I mean, there were the pharaohs of Egypt, and they had history with these guys. There were the kings of Assyria, the leaders of Assyria, and I just love saying their names. There was Tiglath-Pileser and Sennacherib, names that most people don't name their children after. I want to give my child a good biblical name. All right, go with Sennacherib. That's a good one. Tiglath-Pileser. And there in, in the east, there was Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus and Xerxes and Artaxerxes. And he says, all the princes and all the leaders of this world, they are nothing to me. Your God is the sovereign Lord above all things. And the sovereign Lord, he says, he comes with power. We already saw this last week. When God is coming for something that he wants, he is unstoppable. There is nothing that can stand in the way. Like he will, he will take the valleys and he will fill them in. He will take the mountains and the bears and he will flatten them out. He will take the rough spots and he will, he will level it out. There's nothing. He's coming with power. He's coming for you. And I think that when that, that coming with power, I think about that scene from, I think it was the original Jurassic Park, when the T-Rex is coming and you hear this low thud and then the little water glass on the dashboard just starts rippling. He's coming with power, and there's nothing going to stop him. But our God comes with power, and he shows how much power he has in that part where he says that the grass withers and the flower falls, and all the people are like grass. He says, you know why they wither and fall? Because I breathe on them. And this is not divine halitosis. What he's saying is, I have so much power that when you bring the greatest that you have to offer, and it comes until the battle, and he says, I just go, and it's done. That's your God, this powerful one. And not only that, it goes on, it says, and his arm rules for him. Now, let me just go down one little rabbit trail on this one, because I referenced this last week, but I want to come back to that. His arm rules with power. There's a fancy six-syllable word called um, anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is when you take human attributes or human characteristics and put them on something that is non-human. I'll give you an example. Disney does this all the time. If you saw the movie Cars, that you have a tow truck, tow mater. It's a tow truck, but takes on the characteristics of Larry the Cable Guy. Takes that which is human and puts it on the non-human. You know? Or if you've watched Beauty and the Beast, a little teacup called Chip, puts these human attributes on this little teacup. It's, it's, that's um, anthropomorphic terminology. Uh, we use it even like the long arm of the law. Okay, the law the arm, it's, it's using human terms that we understand to help us describe or to, to illustrate something that is beyond that. So when it comes to God, throughout scriptures, there are these anthropomorphic terms that are put on God. The eye of God, the hand of God, the ear of God, the voice of God. Last week, we talked about him trampling our sins under his feet, the feet of God, you know, these, the mouth of God. And here he says with this, this term, he says, his arm rules for him. This is something that you see over and over again in Scripture. 
when Moses in Deuteronomy was reminding them of all that God had done, when he reminds them of how God delivered them out of slavery in Egypt, he writes this to them in Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with, here it is, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Now, does God really have a hand and an arm? No, of course not. But it helps us understand that. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 89, 13. Your arm is endued with power. Your hand is strong. And he even gets more specific. Your right hand exalted. All due respect to those of you who are southpaws, but apparently God's right-handed. I don't know. It just says that. (laughs) Or the time when Job is questioning God and and asking God, explain yourself. Why is all this? And God gets to the point where he says, are you done yet? Okay. Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to ask you a few questions. And he does. One of the questions is this. Job chapter 40, verse 9. Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? So we see this picture of God's arm that rules for him. And Isaiah uses this, the arm of God. He uses this over and over again in his book. If we were going to look at the whole book of Isaiah, which would probably take a decade at the rate I'm going, he uses this over and over again, this arm of God. God's arm represents his strength. And what I love is this little subtlety, and it may not be so in the, in the Hebrew, but at least in the English translations. It says, his arm rules for him. Arm, singular. Like God can rule the universe with one arm tied behind his back. He doesn't even need both of them. He's that great. Behold your God. You know, I grew up... Um, in church, singing hymns. I, I do this frequently, and for some of you, you love it because it takes you back to our childhood. But there was a, a hymn that we sang all the time. And the third verse, we'll have the ladies sing it, and then the men join on the refrain. It's, for those of you who didn't grow up in church, that means nothing to you. The third verse says this. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arm. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on the everlasting arms. Behold your God. Now, it's an interesting thing. Because you get there and you see this greatness of God, and as, as we'll go into next week, he just continues to expound on that, just making it bigger and bigger and bigger. But then you get to verse 11, and verse 11 is like this outlier verse. Verse 11, by the way, is a part of Handel's Messiah. At the end of, at the end of, of, of part one, it's, it's a duet with a mezzo-soprano and a soprano, just in case you were wondering. But... Verse 11 seems so oddly out of place if you read it in the context, even of these verses. It's like it stands out. It's like one of these things is not like the others. It's like, what is this doing here? It seems odd. It it seems like, was this a mistake? And then as you begin to study it, you begin to realize maybe this wasn't a mistake at all. Maybe it, it is very strategic as he juxtaposes this weird outlier, verse 11, amidst all these great other verses. Because maybe, just maybe, God knows that while Israel needs to understand how great and powerful and amazing, majestic that God is, and and he will continue to show that, that maybe it's what they really need is not just a display of power, but an expression of compassion. That yes, they need to know about how great he is but also to show his greatness, not in his brute force and strength and size, but greatness another way. And they had seen power and they'd experienced power. They'd known the power from the surrounding nations. And behold, your God. But maybe what they needed to hear was, behold your God. Because he talks about this sovereign Lord who rules with his arm. And then the very next verse, verse 11, he says this. He tends his flock like a shepherd. The contrast, the dramatic, you know, just complete opposite of this God who rules, and now he tends his flock like a shepherd. 
I love that little phrase, his flock. This goes back to verse one we looked at last week when he says, comfort my people, says your God. This is my flock, he says. I will tend my flock. I will care for my flock. These aren't just people. This isn't just another nation. These are my, my people, my flock. He says he will tend them. I don't know if in high school you ever had to read or were supposed to read or had the opportunity to read a book by John Steinbeck called Of Mice and Men. Um, it's a, it's a kind of a troubling book, but a story about George and Lenny and the Depression, and, and George is kind of watching out for Lenny. Lenny's a big man, powerful man, uh, a bit limited in his abilities, but George and Lenny have this dream that someday they will own a piece of property of their own, and they'll live off the fat of the land. And Lenny, Lenny has this dream of what his part will be, that he will tend the rabbits because this powerful man loves these soft little bunnies. The only problem is he is so powerful, he doesn't know his own strength. And when he pets the little bunnies, he pets them too hard and he accidentally kills them. I, I know, dark, I know. But when you see this contrast of God being all powerful, ruling with his arm, and he tends his flock, you think, is he like, Lenny, don't, don't tend me too hard, God. He tends them like a shepherd. Takes us back to Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He tends the sheep. He leads them along, still waters, gives them water and refreshment, green pastures to rest, and to nourish. He walks with them and protects them in the presence of their enemies. He anoints their head with oil and brings healing. His goodness and his mercy follows them. He tends tenderly his flock. What a contrast to this God who rules with his arm. And not only that, but he goes on and says, and he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them. The lambs, the, the young ones, the most vulnerable, the weak, those that are defenseless. He gathers them in his arms. Now, again, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, and those of you who want to go deeper in this, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, because it may not play out this way. But I find this interesting, if this is the case. In the, in the English translation, he rules the world with an arm. But he gathers his lambs with his arms. As far as the world, he can take care of that with one arm. But when it comes to what's most valuable, most precious to him, what is most near and dear to him, he's going to use both arms. See this arm of the Lord? I mean, it is raised in conquest as the arm that rules. But it reaches in compassion as the arms that gather and carries when you can't even walk yourself. Behold your God. Now, while it points back to Psalm 23, doesn't it also point forward to the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, the gentle shepherd? I love this in Mark chapter 10, verse 14, 16, when it talks about Jesus. He took the children in his arms. He put his hands on them, and he blessed them. The young ones, the vulnerable ones. The Jesus whose arms created the universe, as it says in John 1, that nothing was created apart from him. Jesus who sustains the universe with his arms. Jesus who rules the universe with his arms, takes his arms, and he gathers the lambs, he gathers the children in the same arms that will be extended on a cross to redeem the world. Because God knows that when there's a fragile state, when there's a time of vulnerability, when there's so weakness, when you've been manhandled, when you've been beaten, maybe you don't need a display of power. Maybe you need comfort and compassion. Two chapters later in Isaiah, there'll be this metaphor, this picture used to talk about how our great God handles those in such a fragile state. Isaiah 42 in verse 3, 
It says this, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. A reed on a good day is a weak little thing, but when it's bruised, it's even more fragile and vulnerable. It says, in a bruised reed he will not break off. And this picture of a candle with the wax that's grown so high and the little wick is just above the wax level and the little flame has gotten down to just such a small thing. It would be so easy to say, and it would go out, but he does not. Because our God, in his gentleness, understands our state and he administers accordingly. Well, it goes on, verse 11 again. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. It's so personal, so loving. Again, yes, speaking very metaphorically, which makes it even better that it's not just a proximity, but it's a relationship. It's this covenant. It's this closeness. It's this love, this tenderness, this holding on to. And again, in Isaiah chapter 49, he draws the picture of of the most intimate, close union to illustrate God's love for us. Isaiah 49, he puts out this hypothetical question, verse 13 or 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? What, are you kidding me? What kind of mom would do that? Maybe, though she may forget, God says, I, I will never forget you. I gather the lambs in my arms and carry them close to my heart. Like a mother would care for her her newborn baby. And then he finishes it off with this. Carries them close to his heart and he gently leads those that have young, gently leads them. He doesn't herd them. He doesn't drive them. He doesn't head them up, move them out, rawhide, ha! He doesn't prod them. He doesn't whip them. He gently leads them. Those that have young, they're going to go at a slower pace. He gets that. He gently leads them. Those that have young are not going to be able to go on some terrain and some of the trails. He understands that. And he gently leads them. So Isaiah comes along and he says, Behold your God. Behold your God. Is God great? Yes. Is he weak? Absolutely not. Is he gentle? As the kids would say, 100%. And what we see here in the greatness of God is the display of his gentleness, that God's gentleness is the application of strength, not the absence of strength. It's another facet, another dimension of his greatness that maybe Israel And maybe some of you needed to see today. Because some of you may feel like a bruised reed from whatever you're going through in your life right now. Some of you may feel like a smoldering wick, barely hanging on, not even sure if you could make it in here today. Behold your God. I want to tell you a story that from my own life, Kind of helps me think of this in my terms of growing up, my dad, I talk about my dad a lot, wasn't perfect, but man, he was a great, great dad, great dad. And as most, I would suppose, little kids think of their dad as he was, you know, growing up, he was bigger than life. I mean, he was big, just physically way bigger than me. I was a little kid. Not only that, but he is always my pastor, a powerful preacher, amazing preacher. Some of you years ago, before he died, he preached here, just a powerful preacher. He was a pastor, very influential in my life that way. But, but not only that, I mean, 
Like he, he could fix things. He could do things. He was strong. When, when, I looked at, when I looked at his arm as a little kid, I thought, wow, look at that muscle. I mean, he could take the lid off the pickle jar when no one else could. <laughs> he could undo knots that no one else could. He knew things that no one else, how does he know these things? He could fix things. He, he was bigger than life to me. He was a great dad. Great in goodness, great in magnitude, great in all of these things. As I grew older, in my senior year, I hit a kind of a growth spurt, and there were some things that were changing. I was going from being a little boy to a young man, and there were some appropriate levels of releasing that my parents did to try and launch me and giving me greater independence when there was responsibility, all of these things. And I grew, and I, and I grew, actually, I kept growing. I was the tallest one in the whole family. Physically, dad wasn't larger than life anymore. I was beginning to tower over him and would continue to do so. On top of that, I was becoming not just a little boy. My voice had started changing. I was shaving with a razor this time. Not just scraping off the shaving cream like I did for so many years. Once a week. Every Saturday night, I shaved. Took care of it for a while. I had a job. I bought my own car. I was having more independence. And in some ways, I thought I knew way more than my dad ever could know. And I had this job. This was uh, in 1980, 81. May of 1980, Mount St. Helens Blue. Warehouser lost millions and millions and millions of board feet of timber, blown down by the, by the volcano and covered with ash. And a man in Vancouver got a contract with Warehouser that he would take these logs that they were not going to use and sell them for firewood. And he hired me, and every day after school, I got out early, it was my senior year, I would drive up the Tudor River Valley uh, from, from Portland, Vancouver area, and work there, and then on the way home, I would take a load of logs down to Vancouver that he had sold to someone as firewood. They weren't cut up, they were just long logs, and, and I would drive these trucks. It wasn't like a semi-truck, not a logging truck, but it was much bigger than a pickup truck. It was a mid, mid-sized truck, probably, I don't know, 26, 30 feet long, I'm not sure, but with, with this flatbed and side rails and this dump trailer, and, and I'd, I'd drive this home, and they would load on these logs and put a, a choker around it, and away I went. So, one day, I was driving down the, the Toodle River Valley, down this, this highway, this state route, and there was a vehicle coming toward me, and so just wanted to give it a little more room, just ease to the right a little bit. I'm 17 years old. And when I did that, uh, the dualies on the back just kind of went off that little lip between the pavement and the gravel, just probably three or four inches, maybe, just went down, and it kind of startled me, and so I pulled the truck back on to the road. And when I did that, the load shifted, and the truck shifted, and I overcorrected. And the truck began swerving, and I overcorrected. And this was 1980, 81, was five or six years before the mandatory seatbelt law, so I did not have a seatbelt on. And this truck turned sideways and flipped up onto the passenger side and began to slide down this highway, and I released the steering wheel, and this is only by the grace of God, turned and caught myself on both sides of the passenger window, the window had been shattered, the mirror was smashed there, and the road was going by and caught myself there until the truck came to a stop on its side on this highway. Well, I rolled down the window and pulled myself out and tried to flag down the first car that came and they called and I went into absolute shock. There's parts of that next part of the story I do not remember. But I was injury free but in complete shock. Well, the state patrol eventually came, and the tow truck came, and the state patrol uh, called my parents and said, um, why don't you meet us at the state patrol office, either Kelso or Kalama, I can't remember which. And so they took me there, and, and I just sat in the waiting room waiting for my parents. And my parents walked in, and they said that when they saw me, I was obviously in shock, and I was white as a sheet. And I looked up at my dad, and at that moment, I did not need a sermon from the greatest preacher I had ever known. I didn't need a tutorial from the one who always knew an answer. I didn't need this powerful provider. I didn't need him to fix anything. 
I needed him to gather me in his arms and hold me close to his heart and gently lead me home. And that's what he did. That day, my dad was a giant. Not because of physical stature, not because of what he could do, but because he gathered me in his arms. He tended me like a sheep. He cared for me like a father. And I wonder when Isaiah writes this, if he thinks maybe, maybe there's some in Israel that don't need a display of power. They need an expression of compassion. And maybe there's some of you here today. That's what you need. Well, here is your God. I love this verse in Zephaniah that brings together this greatness of God and the tenderness of God. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord, your God, is with you. Oh, he is mighty to save. But he will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. Behold your God. Can I say this? For each one of us, the truth is this. The arm that rules the world is the arm that holds my life. The arm that gathers you in, carries you when you can no longer walk, holds you close to his heart and gently leads you. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning on the everlasting arms, the gentleness of our God. One more verse. Psalm 18, verse 35 says this. You have given me the shield of your salvation. In your right hand, there's that anthropomorphic terminology again. Your right hand supported me. And your gentleness, the great God, your gentleness, made me great. I just want to say, and we're going to close with a song here in a second, that today, maybe you're in that state where it's like, that's what I needed to hear. And if today you could just use some prayer uh, online, you can click the prayer button. Here in the room, following our service, I and others will be here in the front. would love to just pray with you. But to behold your God, great and gentle.